what you are basically. Deep, deep down, far, far in, is simply the fabric and structure of existence itself. Peace for all men and women, for all men and women, for all men and women. Not merely peace in our time, peace in all time. Honestly expressing yourself. Peace for all men and women, for all men and women, for all men and women. Not merely peace in our time, peace in all time. The fabric and structure of existence. Hi everybody, welcome to the Parallel Mike podcast, episode number 44. I'm your host, Mike. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We are going to be joined by a very special guest, Mr. David Rogers Webb. Now, David was an ex-hedge fund manager. He was extremely successful throughout the 1980s, 90s and 2000s. He managed billions of dollars worth of assets. And he was so successful that when the rest of the industry was losing 40, 50, 60 percent even in the dot-com crisis, which was one of the biggest bubbles and collapses in human history, David actually earned money that year. He was extremely talented and sought after because of it. Now, the reason I've got David on the show is not to talk about his past as a hedge fund manager as much as I would like to do that. We're actually going to be talking about the book, The Great Taking. Now, I've done episodes on this for my Parallel Systems broadcast. I also did an episode for the podcast all about Seed & Co, which lays out The Great Taking. And that's what we're going to talk about. And you have to understand this is one of the most important subjects in the world right now because it lays out in that book how the elites have set up a doomsday device at the heart of the financial system that will ensure that in the next financial crisis, pretty much all of the assets that underpin the financial system, that underpin our financial lives will be taken in the coming financial collapse. And there will be no recourse for us because they have shored up the legal system They've implemented new legal structures to ensure this cannot be done. So in part one, we discuss how we got to where we are today, who is behind it, what was the steps that had to be put in place to enable a great taking to happen. And then in part two, for members of OnParallelMike.com, we start to discuss solutions, how we can begin to go about protecting ourselves from some of the many hardships that are ahead of us. And it's not just the great taking. There's many other things that we get into in this. And ultimately, what we get to is talking about parallel systems, becoming more self-sufficient, and of course, the spiritual component. We have an extensive conversation about the spiritual side of life and how this feeds into the great taking. So there is so much in this one, and I do think it's probably one of the most important interviews that I've ever done, just because the time is late in the day now. We don't have long left before some of these things actually manifest in reality. So that's why I'm going to leave it for the introduction. Just a quick note, we do have coaching for investors beginning again in February. This is group coaching where we are focusing on the skills of risk management and wealth preservation. And listening to The Great Taking, you're probably aware that there are so many threats to our wealth, to our property rights. So that's what I specialize in. That's what the coaching is all about. Irrespective of how The Great Taking unfolds, I think we are going to see the greatest wealth transfer in human history. We have to protect ourselves and our family's wealth from what lies ahead. And unfortunately, we have to do it for ourselves. There's no financial advisor out there that's going to be able to do this for us. So that's what Investor Coaching is about. I'm going to put a video link in the description. There are limited places now. So if you are interested, please reach out. Out to me at parallel mic podcast at protonmail.com. So I'm going to leave it there for the introduction. I hope you're all well, healthy, and happy. Members, please head over to parallelmic.com to sign in to listen to the full episode. If you are not a member yet, please consider becoming a member at parallelmic.com. And trust me, this is one you do not want to miss. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Parallel Mike podcast. We are welcoming David Rogers Webb to the show. David was a successful hedge fund manager for most of his life, but you will all know him as the author of The Great Taking, which lays out this uh, doomsday device, really, that will enable the elite banking cartels to enact what would be the largest asset grab in history. So welcome to the show, David. Happy New Year. And uh, just thank you for all of the work you've done thus far. That's When I was making some notes for this one, I asked my audience, are there any questions uh, you want to put forward for David? And I expected a really long list, but I actually got a list just of thanks, just extending their thanks. So that's what I wanted to open with. That's wonderful. 
Well, and I, you know, I want to say, Mike, that I I am deep deeply grateful to you, and I I I was before we ever, you know, met each other and talked. Um, it was uh, very early on. You were really the first person that I was aware of that did any piece on this. Um, and I, I think we now know what the path of travel was. And it, it's kind of a kind of a miraculous thing. Um, uh, I, I, had, I was sitting in this room. I received a phone call in July. So this was just after the, the book had been released in its PDF form. I had sent out the manuscript at the end of May. I'd written it secretly. Only two people knew about it. And and on an old computer, I never connected to the internet. And my my real concern was I, that I needed to complete it and get it out before anything happened or I got shut down. So I had sent it out to a few hundred people at the end of May. And then um, Michael Palmer was one of the first people to respond. I had known Michael from... Um, uh, different actions and efforts against the Green Pass in Europe and other things. Um, so he read it and uh, said, "This has to, this has to be spread." And he uh, dropped everything to help me. And um, the the it is Michael who made it look as good as it looks. He he. Uh, yeah, I had all the documentation on my computer, but most of it was gone from the internet. So he, if he couldn't find, you know, he's a scientist, he's accustomed to publishing things to a very high standard. So he made sure that everything was referenced properly. And if he couldn't find the document that I was referencing, I had it on my computer. So I gave it to him and then he put those up in an archive so they can't disappear now. Um, so he did all of that incredible work and the, the really professional formatting of it. And um, he found that cover image. So he's a real Renaissance man. That co cover image is just brilliant. Um, and uh, so that was released in July. And then I got this phone call while I was sitting here. And it was this man in New Zealand. He he told me a remarkable story. It's just a voice on the other end of the phone. I didn't, uh, it, it was, um, uh, he, he said that his family had been involved in U.S. intelligence going back to the, the World War I. So essentially the beginning of this entire cycle that we're in now. And his, uh, both his grandmother and grandfather, they were basically the ultimate power couple at that time at The Hague in the Netherlands from the U.S. side. And um, uh, he, uh, I know, I, I, I discovered later what had happened was that um, he had visited with Doug Casey in Argentina and he had well, let me let me back up. The way the book got to this man was um, my wife had given it to a childhood friend who lives in New Zealand. And the way they met, this goes back over 60 years. They met as tiny children. My wife could remember hiding behind her mother's dress, meeting this other child for the first time. And that is how this happened. These kinds of things span, uh, you know, there, there's kind of a miraculous connection of things that had to happen. So, so that connection with this friend it goes back over 60 years. She passed, my wife passed the book to her. This man who was on the phone, I asked him, how did you get the book? And he said, a Kiwi orchardist gave it to me. And I thought, all right, I think I can probably confirm that this is a real person on the other end of the phone with that clue. So I was able to track it down that it had gone from this childhood friend in New Zealand to her son 
to this kiwi or kiwi orchardist and then to this man and then i was able to ask this friend of my wife to visit him and confirm who he is <laughs> and then then i then i knew that i could really work with him um so he had gone to uh he had been in argentina met doug casey and of course met then i went to matt smith and to you and um from that point doug uh, i i wasn't aware of the doug case doug casey having mentioned it i just saw your piece someone sent it to me i think but from that point this was now early september a lot has happened it really really started taking off at that point so at at that time i was kind of um I didn't know how to talk about it yet. I had written it, but I didn't know how to how to explain it in a in a presentation. And so you were way ahead of me, and I really appreciated very much the uh, kind of dark humor you brought to it. Um, I it's still one of my one of my very favorite pieces that has been done on it. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate that a lot, David. I, I always think you're too kind when you say that because, uh, you know, it's uh, we could sit here all day and you, you thank me and we're like, no, we thank you. But uh, yeah, that that's kind of the story for me as well. Like I, I heard it on, uh, I heard Matt and Doug talk about it. I think Matt brought it up and then I read it the next morning. It was, and I remember it was still warm enough that I was able to sit on my deck in and sit there and read it. And there's a couch out there and I sat and read it in one take. So yeah, September, but it was still pretty warm here in September. And uh, I immediately knew intuitively, like, this is so important. Like, this is all the things that I've been thinking and feeling for years. I was like, this is like the missing piece to all of that. And then a really strange thing happened. I've never actually told you about this. But that night, I went to bed, uh, having read it and had been thinking about it all day. And I actually woke up at about 4 a.m., which never happens. I sleep pretty good. Uh, and I, I almost heard a voice in my head saying, you have to make an episode on this one and you have to put it out tomorrow. And if you do, it's going to be important. Like, it was really weird. I just had this feeling that all right, I have to make an episode. So I, I almost recorded that thing in one take because I just wanted to get it out. And I was still trying to get to grips with the material because it does require a few readings. But anyway, I... I put it together and then sure enough uh, Matt shared it with his channel and then I thought wow so that was weird that intuitive thought was right that I needed to make that episode and yeah it was just kind of like a placeholder until I guess you came along and started doing your interviews and I got a lot of phone calls asking from people asking me to interview to discuss it and I was like I don't I David needs to discuss it he's the expert but for a little time uh, I think you were still getting to grips with right. I'm I'm gonna have to go out there and speak about this. Well, I asked you. I asked you to carry carry it. Yeah, because I wasn't I was ready to do it, and I I mean it meant a lot to me that you would just pick it up and run with it. Um, this is the force multiplier that that it, 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 people people take this on and they they do something with it that's why it has uh you know gone so far so fast that's what we need yeah and it certainly has yeah it certainly has and you know i guess one of the one of the criticisms that i've had a lot of people put forward and especially in finance which is very interesting but i think i know why it is but i'd love to get your take and that criticism is, well, it's so big and dark and it's such a horrific kind of end to the financial system as we know it, that it can't be true. And it's almost like because it's such a big thing, they equate that with very small risk. You know, it's so unlikely that this could be true, that it means it's a small risk. Yeah, I mean, this idea of a, a black swan, this very small tail risk, it, it is... Um that that's not the the right way to look at something like this. Absolutely. It's being made to happen. It is, um, if you're heading towards something that is, um, um, uh, you know, everything is leading toward it, then it's not a tail risk. 
Yeah, I agree. It's not a case of like there's going to be somebody sat there like it would be, let's say, with the nuclear codes. You know, if you wanted to launch a nuke, there's somebody sat there. They have to make a conscious decision. They put a code in, they click enter. There's maybe five other people that have to do the same. Whereas this is a little bit different in that they actually have created the mechanism and installed that mechanism. And unless you dismantle it, there is no other mechanism like that is almost kind of enshrined into it now. Uh, and it will almost be automatic. It won't be like there's somebody sat there saying, we have to agree to this. It will just, if the system started to say, come under systemic pressure tomorrow and you had institutions failing, it's almost like an automatic snare that just uh, gets triggered. It's all being, I, I think this idea of a black swan and a tail risk, um, that is a smokescreen. It's something that has been put into the popular consciousness to create the impression that all this is just accidental. It is absolutely not accidental. <laughs> so this, this idea that, yeah, something will happen that was entirely unpredictable, that is entirely untrue about this. This is entirely predictable, planned, and when it, when it, it if it is allowed to, be implemented you know if they pull the trigger on this it will be delivered when that happens do you think there's a sort of naivety then david in the west because i guess we've had it so good for so long you know if you think the last generation that was really under severe hardship in the west would have been the great depression which you talk about in, in your book and i'd love to talk a little bit more about but i guess since say the 60s or 70s we've been seduced by owning digits on a screen and having financialized assets and we trust in that system that we've kind of lost touch with reality in the west as to what real wealth is real wealth is real stuff that's produced you know that you've got a farm but in the west we've kind of lost that and maybe that's part of this uh, why people are so incredulous to it they're like no it, it can't fail but it, i i see it more of we failed because we've kind of forgotten what real wealth is about yeah well, it's it's that quote from Sun Tzu that uh, in you you position the enemy into uh, a, a position a, a disadvantaged position by causing them to chase profits. So it's chasing chasing money, chasing the easy money, giving up um, re really the sustainable means of self support. Um, uh, pe people are, we, we now know this people are easily led by money incentives and it's, it's infected our whole society. I, I, uh, I've taken to, to explaining lately my, my, my idea of this kind of, um, it, what passes for morality in our society now is, um, first of all, something like don't be a floor mat take care of yourself first even 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 to the disadvantage of people closest to you in your own family don't be a floor mat this kind of that that is an imperative that you 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 have to put yourself ahead of others um another is um that why of course i have to be paid for what i'm doing why would I do something unless I'm being paid to do it? And of course, I will do whatever. If something else will pay me more, I will do that. So it's directing one's life based like as if that is uh, intelligent or or um, a kind of imperative for people to to make the most significant decisions and in the use of all of their life's energies based on whatever is going to pay them the most. This is, this is obviously this has infected our whole society. Um, and it's, it's um, what, what we're, what we're going to find is that none of that was real. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, it's uh, I mean, sometimes I call it dead materialism. Some people call it hype materialism, but it really does feel like we're at the bottom rung of this materialist era and the pendulum does have to swing back the other way. And it maybe it's going to take something extremely dramatic to get people to think like that. And, you know, I sometimes try and 
explain it to people like we own all of these things on a screen but what really matters is that you can provide for yourself that you've got food that you've got water that you've got energy that you've got self-sufficiency that you're not beholden to somebody uh, and that's a spiritual thing as well the bible talks a lot about debt and how debt is actually the enemy like you don't want to be indebted because to be indebted is to be enslaved by someone and essentially we are all unknowingly within this system becoming slaves to let's face it criminal enterprises i mean central banks and commercial banks and what they get away with and how insulated they've become in the system that they can't be prosecuted uh that they can just take people's assets uh, and use them to backstop their own gambling habits it is a criminal enterprise that we're up against and i think people need to have their eyes open to that well what you know what i've been doing over the last you know, a couple of months or since since writing the book is thinking about um, how things can be unwound. That's important, but also a bigger understanding of what is happening. Uh, going back to understanding um, the roots, there's a there's a continuity from um, through socialism, communism, national socialism and right into the Fabian Society and the London School of Economics. Uh, uh, so we, we need to understand that this, it's, it, it's not explained by greed and just criminality. There is an ideology behind this that is joined at the hip with the banking power with the private central banks. So they have, um, they like the idea of central planning and control and they use wars to expand debt and their power over and over again. So this, you know, the roots of this really goes back to the, the Bank of England, 400 years, um, it may be that the Revolutionary War in the United States, we're not taught this in the, in the history books, but it may have been more about um, a, a war against the banking power from Europe, being independent of the banking power of Europe. And what, what happened is the United States became um, largely self-sufficient, was not dependent on the banking power of Europe. And they didn't like that. Uh, they they wanted to get control again. Um, so there were there were repeated attempts to uh, establish a uh, privately a privately controlled central bank. But the the founding fathers were adamant that this must not be allowed. There 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 could it could not be a fiat money system. Um, but but. Uh, what what we have in the latter 19th century leading into the 20th century are these ideas behind uh, all the totalitarian movements and the um, banking powers funded all of them <laughs> were embedded in all of them. The, the bankers were literally riding around in cars dressed in military uniforms in the Bolshevik period in Russia. So here we have the royal family being, uh, you know, uh, shot to bits and then chopped into smaller bits and then their body, the little bits thrown down a mine shaft. All that time that is being funded by the private banks. They're they're in league with people like this, so um, they they funded the Bolsheviks, they funded uh, the National Socialists, um, and by uh, one of the, one of the books I've read recently is Friedrich Hayek's uh, Road to Serfdom. It was my grandfather's copy. I happen to have here in. And it was printed in 1944, so before the end of the war. And Hayek is warning that the very people running the economic establishment in Britain are the same people. <laughs> so the the Fabians, the the Fabians, uh, in their own documents, they describe that 
popular democracy cannot be allowed. The public can't be allowed to decide things. There has to be uh, an aristocratic uh, elite that uh, direct the society. And, um, you know, as I said, they, they formed the London School of Economics. People like uh, Bertrand Russell, who is considered to be a genius, who uh, was a philosopher and mathematician, clearly a very smart guy. But by the 1950s, he wrote a piece about, they, they have this idea that um, due to the advances in science and technology, that um, there has to be central planning. And as Hayek, Hayek points out in Road to Serfdom, that this is an unexamined idea that they have, that uh, this penchant for central planning. As Hayek make, makes the point, the real world is so complex, it cannot be centrally planned. And we see this over and over again with totalitarianism. It creates ab an absolute hell on earth disaster. But they... So what you, given the complexity of the world, especially if your objective is human well-being, human happiness, you have to have uh, autonomous units that can reorganize to meet unmet human needs. But that's not their purpose with this. It, it begins with um, something that appears to be benevolent, and that, that's fine. We, as Hayek says, we need to plan roads and things like that. But then it tips into malevolence. And that is with the help and the backing of the, of the central bankers. <laughs> this, is, this is done. So by, by the time we get to the 50s, you have these statements by the Club of Rome, by Bertrand Russell his, 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 himself is um, explaining that, well, with the advance in technology, we, we can't afford to have war, but war is the organizing principle of society. This is, again, just an assertion of theirs. Now, whose idea is that? that war is the organizing principle of society, something that always is not about protecting people. It always hurts people on all sides. So that is their idea, that they have to have ongoing wars. It's, it's connected with, from the beginning, with their power. So in the formation of the Bank of England, as well as the Federal Reserve, this always happens in a time of war. Um, to go to a fiat money system to fund the wars. And then this private group creates the money from out of nothing to buy the government debt to fund the war. And then the people are encumbered to pay interest on that debt that they created out of nothing. That is the beginning of their awesome power. Then they use the government bonds that they bought with money created out of nothing to pyramid that up into loans to the public. That becomes their capital base. Um, so they, they, use, they use war from the very beginning of creating these central banks. And then they perpetuate their power through these, through these wars. Um, so, so Bertrand Russell is saying in the 50s, well, what are we going to do if we don't have global war? Well, we're going to need something else that is equally threatening toward the public. He discusses this explicitly, and it will probably have to kill a lot of people. And it could be something like um, a, a bacterial infection that would spread globally. So they were thinking about this even then. Um, uh so we're we're facing this now um it is the w the way i think of it when you when you when you have a finite money system uh to to come up with money you have to sell something a product or a service which keeps a lid on everything 
But if you come up with a way to create money out of nothing, initially it is a, a incredible power and it creates a very high velocity of money, a turnover on that money that is created because big projects get done that wouldn't be, it would never happen. And people, you know, turn turn that money over several times during a year. So when when I did a money and banking course in about 1980 in the textbook, I remember I was very interested in this even then. The textbook said that the velocity of money on this created money could be six, seven, eight times. And um, so this isn't looking at the entire money stock. This is the incremental money created. Um, so what was happening in the late 90s after the first really global financial crisis, uh, the Asian financial crisis, the the velocity of money, you know, I could see that the money being created by the central banks was about 10 times whatever economic activity was actually happening. So what that showed was that this ratio had flipped from being a high multiplier on the money created, it had inverted so that, that it, the money creation was an order of magnitude larger than whatever economic growth was happening. And I knew at that point we were going into um, some kind of an end stage phenomena because once that happens, it's irreversible. But it's it's such a big, big geopolitical process that it takes, doesn't work out in a couple of years. It's, it's a, a decades long process. So as, as the power to create growth with the money breaks down, now the money creation goes into financialization, which we know. But the other thing that people don't really face up to is it goes into warfare increasingly. So right on the heels of that, we had the September 11th attacks, the global war on terror. We know how much that changed the United States. Uh, it, it's definitely a before and after situation. And they, they do not really have another play in their playbook. They, they attempted to use the story of saving the planet. Uh, even back in the 50s, they were talking about creating pollution, global pollution. So that could be used as a reason to reduce the population. They actually discussed these things. So they, they, they wanted something that they could use that would take a lot of money. If you look at, if you look at their plans for going to carbon, you know, uh, zero, <laughs> zero carbon emissions and their estimates of what that would cost, you know, that, they love that. They, they, they want something that will just cause huge amounts of national indebtedness um, but the pro the problem with and they and they had the language save the planet, which of course they trotted out again with the global global warming narrative. Um, the problem is it it's all bullshit. It's not going to work as a narrative. And so if we if we observe what is happening. Um, the global war is escalating in uh, in violence, and this is the threat we are facing. So, what do we have? We have uh, COVID, which was a uh, hybrid war strategy of some kind. It may take us some time to really understand what all the uh, uh, objectives of that were. Uh, then right on the heels of that, without missing a beat, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the violence in Ukraine, um, then uh, the, what I will call a false flag in, in with, with Hamas justifying this, this uh, expanding war in the Middle East. Um, and now in the last few weeks, uh, for example, I'm in Sweden. Uh, the government 
uh, I guess was maybe three weeks ago, the entire Riksdag was assembled in front of the military and told uh, that uh, uh, the nation was preparing for war and uh, what the chain of who they would be answering to uh, in this war. And uh, then they began a public facing um, uh, uh, process of basically threat threatening the public of Sweden that they're behind the curve and not prepared for war to the extent that children were panicked into calling helplines. Um, it's, it's, it's terrible. And then in roughly the same period in, uh, maybe this is happening in a lot of other places in, um, uh, uh, Ecuador, um, they, they announced the government announced that it was, uh, uh, declaring an internal state of war in Ecuador. Now, how is that done? In, I guess, one day, 30 car bombs were detonated across the country, something like that, and masked gunmen um, uh, invaded a television station on air and supposedly they, these are drug cartels that are doing this. Now think about it. What drug operator wants attention like that? <laughs> they, they would be quietly doing their business. Why would they detonate car bombs across the country and draw attention themselves by sending mass gunmen into a TV station. It, it just doesn't make any sense. But uh, unless what you were doing is very, very efficiently, doesn't didn't cost much money to do that, to create a condition where you can now declare uh, uh, a war environment with, within the country. So we're, we're seeing this um, spreading and they 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 don't know how to stop. This is this is their their only strategy, and it always always has been their only strategy. So it's um, you know humanity really faces um, um, a, a very real threat now globally, and uh, you know what I'm. What I'm explaining is it, it is um, pe people have to realize this stuff doesn't just happen. It is it is linked with the private, the privately controlled central banks. I don't know. Maybe I've gone on too, too long on that. Do you want to ask, ask something no, else? It's interesting <laughs> that you mentioned the Fabians. We just, uh, I just finished the podcast on them the other week with my friend Matt. We, uh, we, I was laughing during it because you mentioned Bertrand Russell. And this is what you find, and the listeners will know this if they've followed my more in depth work, is that whenever you look back at the people who they elevated to positions of uh, authority in any field, whether it's science, economics, uh, the arts, they were always of a certain ilk and they always carried the same views, which were the following eugenics. Um, ruled by a few, a few very elite aristocrats over the many. That was always the case. And Bertrand Russell was, like you said, he was arguing that we should have an aristocratic socialist elite. But what was really funny was he was a man who owned 20 properties across the world, including all of the major power centers he had properties in, in uh, Beijing, in Italy, in America, all across the world. So they want to take our property rights. They want to take our stuff and reduce us to something that, you know, would be more like cattle. And yet they retain their power and their ownership. And they do that through the banking system. So you find the same, the same themes wherever you look. It was the same John Maynard Keynes. I mean, everyone lords up Keynes uh, as uh, this uh, economics powerhouse. However, he was exactly the same. He was a eugenicist. He was somebody that purported to uh, want to have people in this socialist state where you have these elites ruling over us. Uh, and I find it wherever I look, David. So I think for listeners, you, you do have to go back to understand the long arc of history. Where we are today isn't something that's transpired over the last 20, 30 years. It goes back a uh, hundred years at least. But then like you said, you go back to 
the Bank of England or before that you go back to the Venetians in, in Italy and the, the, the Medici Bank. And it was always about consolidating power amongst uh, a minority. It was, I mean, it's as old as time, David. But but I guess getting us back on track with the great taking, how close do you think we are from such an event being triggered? Is it possible to put a time scale on it as to how close it could be before we see something like that? Well, I I think we're very close. I think we're basically in it. Uh, I mean, we're certainly we're certainly in a global hybrid war. It is well underway, and um, you know, people are being killed. Hundreds of thousands of people are being killed. This is real. It's really happening now, and um, I'd say it's manifest. And the the um, you know the the idea that they wouldn't do something like this. Well, they've they've done it before. Uh, you know, maybe we'll go back and talk about what happened in the in the depression. Why that's exactly like this. But to to have unleashed uh, the the whole COVID strategy and all the damage done by that. You you know you can't there it's on what they're doing now and the the financial aspect we know that um the the plans for the solvent wind down in europe are complete um the exercises have been done you know all the plumbing is in place for this it's it's um I, I I think the the move up in interest rates, the scale of the insolvencies is just uh, it's beyond tens of trillions. This is being masked right now. And you know, of course they're they're now talking about lowering rates again, but the damage has been done at this point. And if if you you see you know things are things are not as <laughs> someone someone sent me an article about that about how they're saying quantitative tightening is open uh, over and I I, I message back happy days are here again <laughs> I don't I don't think <laughs> I don't think that is going to happen Yeah, neither do I. Yeah, I think like you said, what they've. I mean, essentially, they've backed themselves into an impossible corner, and it feels like the only way out of it would be a reset of sorts. And of course, if if you're going to reset it, you're going to reset it so you are at the top, and everyone. I mean, you're gonna you're gonna make it so you've got even more entrenched power to control people. They have backed themselves into a corner. It is an impossible situation for them. There is no way out of this for them, given what they have done. It is entirely possible to not have this happen. They are making it happen. They're making the wars happen. They are making the financial collapse happen. It, it, this can be stabilized and wound down but it's a matter of uh, you know getting getting control of the tiller <laughs> to, to to do that. Um, well, if I can, I describe another thing that I've a way I've been explaining this to people, you know, to 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 help them see the see the really the simplicity of what we face here. It's um, so um, primates live in troops of 30 to 80 individuals. And of course, humans evolved in the same way. So with in, there's a symbiosis in a, a, in a group of individuals that size where they all have different abilities and, and disabilities um, that complement. And we, we know that, um, uh, well, beyond that level, they, they split off into another group. So uh, with we know that um, there are people that we describe as sociopaths or psychopaths. This pathology is a recurring thing. It's always been with us. It always will be in a, in a small group of people like that, a village or a tribe. 
in childhood, people like this would be known by their peers, their playmates. They would know who these people are. They wouldn't kill them because they're somebody's, you know, brother. <laughs> and they're part of the family. They're in your family. So, but, so, so you, you would, uh, there are people that don't have empathy there. It, 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 it could be a, rather than a disability, a kind of ability in the appropriate context. So they, they are people that don't mind hurting things, might even enjoy it. So um, you could take them out on the hunting party and th they would enjoy that. They would be good at that. <laughs> but, but you wouldn't let them babysit your children and you would know not to do that. So everybody was known. Now, now we start getting city states. And what happens? We start getting totalitarianism right off. You know, the ancient Greeks are talking about it, how this happens. So when you when you get into a um uh you start getting into inhuman scale of of civilization. Um, the, the people like this can uh, get into positions of power. Now, if we, if we look at, say, the, U, the, the colonies or the U.S., let's say that they had uh, fought this war to be independent of the uh, European banking power. They're on a, a finite money system. You could have people, you would have people like this, but they couldn't take down the entire system. They could, sure, they could have a private bank that that could succeed or fail or have some run something somewhere, but it would run its course. And certainly within their lifetime, it would run its course. The problem we have is that these people control the private central banks so we have a situation where we, we have psychopaths, sociopaths that have unlimited funding behind them. And their business model is joined at the hip with warfare. This, this is what we all have to face up to. It, it's, not, it's not just greed. It's, it's not uh, really even rational in any way. It's that they have this uh, pathology and um, they um, regularly resort to war. And we, we, so they have now followed this and, and the logic behind socialism and communism and all the totalitarian systems, they like that. They're big supporters of that and always have been. And so that is what we are heading for. And they they now have reached a point where they they are within striking distance of implementing this globally. So this this is this is what we all have to face up to. And before the call started, Mike, we were talking about this that. You know, it's so dark that people don't want to see it. I think the right spirit to have is to welcome knowing. You, you have to enter into it positively, welcome it, because then you can, you can pass through it. We can all pass through it. And this, so I'm, I'm cycling back to when will this great taking happen and will it happen? Well, our, our purpose should be to um, not allow this to happen because we are going into an escalating uh, global hybrid war. A lot of people are going to be hurt. Uh, we, you know, time is short to face this down. Okay, so we're going to leave it there for part one, everyone. But trust me, we are only just getting started on this one. Part two is filled with really actionable advice as to how we can begin to go about that process of getting ourselves financially and practically ready because that's absolutely key. There's so many threats now to our food, to our water, to our energy, and of course to our finances, and that's what we're going to discuss. And then we have an extensive conversation about the spiritual component of this because trust me, that one is absolutely critical. In fact, I personally don't think we're going to be able to stop 
stop what happens unless we have that component. And we talk a lot about community, spirituality, how we keep ourselves grounded in this world of never ending crisis and dystopia. And listen, we pull no punches in part two. We discuss it as it is. We certainly don't try to make out like this can all be solved by just doing some meditation and we can just fix it overnight, but we can do a lot to get ourselves ready. So I hope to see you there in part number two for this fantastic conversation with a brilliant man, Mr. David Rogers Webb. It was an absolute honor to interview him, especially the conversation we have in part two, because for me, that really gets to the meat of things, which is what is meaningful and why are we here? We're not just here to consume. We're not just here to accumulate. We're also here to actually find meaning and that can only be found in community and by looking towards something bigger than man. And I think the lack of that is what has taken us to where we are today. And bringing that back might just be what saves us. Also, just a reminder that you can get in touch with me for a one-to-one consultation. I do work with people helping them to understand how to preserve their wealth. You can find out more details on my website, parallelmike.com. Also, in February, we have group coaching beginning again. The first group has gone fantastic. We've been focusing extensively on how to protect ourselves from things like the great taking, How do we preserve our wealth? How do we get ourselves practically and financially ready? Similarly, we are also looking at the opportunities that will arise as this system becomes more and more unstable because there will be opportunities. It will be the greatest wealth transfer in human history. And whilst it might seem trite to talk about accumulating wealth during a time like this, we do have a duty to ourselves and to our family to preserve our wealth, to not lose it in some financial crisis or crash. And I think there's some big opportunities ahead, but we have to be extremely careful in light of the great taking. So if you are interested, there are limited spaces left on that one. So please reach out at your earliest convenience to Parallel Mike Podcast at ProtonMail.com and I will give you more information. There is also a video link in the description. In closing, I hope you're all well, healthy, and having a fantastic 2024 so far. Yes, it's going to be a difficult year, but we can all rise to the occasion. That's what I'm all about. In part two, we talk a lot about how we can do that. So I'm going to leave it there for part one. I wish you all good health and happiness. And like always, I'll see each and every one of you in the next one. What you are basically. Deep, deep down, far, far in, is simply the fabric and structure of existence itself. Peace for all men and women, for all men and women, for all men and women. Not merely peace in our time, peace in all time. Honestly expressing yourself. Peace for all men and women, for all men and women, for all men and women. Not merely peace in our time, peace in all time. The fabric and structure of existence. Not really peace in our time, peace in all time.